qubits. Um, but still no categories. <laughs> but still no, yeah, you're, <laughs> Focon's quite happy to have lots of qubits as long as there are no categories. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so indeed, what I want to talk about today is this connection with um, quantum mechanics and, and, and to go in, in, in enough detail to see exactly how the kind of tables which we've been discussing can be uh, uh, arise directly from the predictions of quantum mechanics. And this leads on to an interesting theoretical question, which is um, how complicated is this class of such tables which are generated by quantum mechanics? And there's an interesting and apparently quite deep open question there, which I think can be interesting to logicians and also seems to be related to well-known open problems in, uh, in operator algebras and other, other kinds of mathematics. So I thought I'd start just by a brief review of uh, Hilbert spaces, mainly to say that um, what we need to know here is, is, is not, uh, not, not very much. Um, um, Hilbert spaces play obviously are the basic setting for the formalization of uh, quantum mechanics. As we indicated in the timeline, that we uh, discussed in the first lecture, uh, that the current foundations for ordinary quantum mechanics, which provides the basis for pretty much all discussion in quant quantum information and computation, are the foundations laid down by John von Neumann in his book, Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, published in English in 1932. Uh, German version a few years earlier, and this is based on Hilbert spaces. Hilbert spaces are so named by von Neumann as a kind of uh, homage to David Hilbert. There is a story, probably apocryphal, that Hilbert was uh, listening to one of um, um, von Neumann's lectures, and he, at some point, he he sort of leaned over to his neighbour and said, "What are these Hilbert spaces?" Uh, um, Anyway, uh, a Hilbert space is, so, so what, we, what we need to say is that a Hilbert space is a complex inner product space, and then um, in general it can be infinite dimensional. Uh, there's a norm defined from the inner product, and the space has to be complete in this norm. Um, physicists are often very, quite cavalier about the uh, analytical aspects. Um, so we know that with, so it's a vector space with an inner product. Uh, and the, the thing that we can mainly think of, and we'll see why in a moment, is just think of C to the N. Complex vector space, n-dimensional complex vector space. Everything is uh, complex vectors and matrices. The salient notion of basis for uh, Hilbert spaces is uh, a vector space basis which is moreover orthonormal, so it consists of pairwise orthogonal unit vectors, orthogonality of a pair of vectors, they're sort of at right angles to each other, perpendicular to each other, just that the inner product uh, goes to zero. Um, and Hilbert spaces are incredibly rigid. Up to isomorphism, there is only one Hilbert space in each dimension. So dimension is cardinality of orthonormal basis, and that's an invariant of the space. Uh, and up to isomorphism, there is only one Hilbert space in each dimension. Um, which means that in principle, um, the possibilities for ordinary quantum mechanics are the finite dimensional Hilbert spaces c to the n, and the countably, uh, the separable Hilbert space, whose representation, and not the only one, but whose standard representation is just uh, countable sequences of complex numbers bounded in the L2 norm. And that's it. Um, the, the, the fa there's a famous correspondence between this sequence space and a much fancier looking thing, the so-called big L2 space, which is the one where the wave functions live, which are usually taught in an introductory quantum mechanics course. The two things are the same, and this is really the correspondence between the, um, well, this thing, which of course is a standard piece of mathematics, is a correspondence between the Schrodinger wave function picture and the Heisenberg matrix mechanics. Uh, picture, which were the two original founding formulations of, uh, of quantum mechanics, which were then uh, rigorized by Hilbert. And they come, they're actually describing the same uh, separable Hilbert space. 
So for ordinary quantum mechanics, in principle, that's all there is. I say in principle because pragmatically, a different representation with a different choice of basis can have a lot of value in actually modeling problems. And indeed, uh, in the introductory course, as I was saying, people don't use this sequence space. They use the uh, space of uh, uh, the, the big L2 space of functions on a configuration space. And in, um, I, uh, by the way, um, so one, one might say, well, you know, the, the modern way of doing things would be with C star algebras. And it's, it's uh, C star algebra is a very elegant uh, algebraic structure, very much studied, but not really more general. By the famous Gelfand Neimark theorem, every C star algebra is isomorphic to a subalgebra of the bounded operators on a Hilbert space. So we're back to Hilbert spaces. Um, and actually, most of quantum information restricts consideration to the finite dimensional cases. So really, just with uh, complex inner product spaces of finite dimensions, the, the C to the N. So I, I, an objection, perhaps? Um, the, well, I'm, I'm referring to a result which, uh, says, which says this. Uh, um, is that not due to Gelfand and Neimark? I mean, there is, of course, the Gelfand Neimark duality theorem for the commutative case, but there is a theorem that says that every C star algebra is isomorphic to a subalgebra of B of H. I thought it was due to Gelfand and Neimark. Okay, great, right. So, so, there is, so, so it's not that Gelfand Neimark theorem. Actually, I think, that, isn't that called the Gelfand representation theorem? The commutative case. So the Gelfand Neimark is the is the case for general C star algebras. Okay. So um, as I say, most of quantum because if you think of a quantum circuit, um, there are going to be finitely many qubits. You think of a protocol for quantum cryptography. Um, all those situations we're dealing with finitely many degrees of freedom, uh, and and we're just in uh, finite dimensions. Now, um, mostly, linear algebra is taught as a very uh, introductory course. And you might think, well, if quantum information is just about finite dimensional linear algebra, isn't that trivial? Um, and the answer, of course, is no. Um, and it's kind of interesting. In a way, there's an analogy with the, the sort of measure theory probability theory thing. I mean, I, uh, so we, we, we could say that. Uh, you know, the, the measure, th I mean, probability theory is a vastly richer and more interesting subject than measure theory, livelier subject than measure theory. I don't know if this is going to annoy Prakash or not, but um, uh, uh, even though in a sense it's a special case, because it has so much to be about and so many concepts that come in from all the things that you model with, uh, with probability theory. And in a sense, something like that is, is going on when we come to quantum information, even though the, the medium for most of it is is just matrices, operators on finite dimensional complex linear algebra, uh, there's a whole wealth of notions that come in. So that's part of the answer. Is, uh, and indeed, we'll see what I think is a challenging open problem uh, a bit later in this lecture, which um, uses no more than finite dimension, well, which raises the issue of dimensionality in an interesting way. Another reason there's more to it than just what one encounters in an um, introductory course in linear algebra um, is that uh, something plays a very important role in quantum information, which doesn't usually show up in an introductory linear algebra course. And this is the tensor product. And as one might say, the multilinear uh, aspect as well as just the linear algebra aspect. So the, the, the point, this is very important. This is the way we put systems together in, um, in quantum mechanics. And this is already in um, von Neumann's book, although he doesn't have a very explicit uh, discussion of, uh, of uh, the tensor product, the way it would appear in a more modern account. Um, compound systems, if you have a system represented by a Hilbert space H and another system represented by a Hilbert space K, in general, the way you put them together is not by taking a direct product kind of construction, but, but a tensor product. And this is exactly where Alice and Bob live. This is why you get all these interesting multi-party uh, protocols, uh, entanglement and so on. This all lives in typically in uh, tensor product spaces. Um, 
And the point is that the possibilities in the tensor product are not just limited to a possibility from one, com uh, one factor together with a possibility from the other. You get, uh, you get superpositions and you get the phenomena we associate with entanglement. So there's lots one can say about uh, tensor product from, from the more abstract point of view. Um, if we bring in categories, then, then we would have a beautiful symmetric monoidal structure. And in finite dimensions, we have a sort of hom tensor duality and all kinds of beautiful things come out from that. But, but for our purposes here, let's just be very concrete and say that if H has an orthonormal basis, say the, the vectors psi i, and K has an orthonormal basis phi j, then we can build an orthonormal basis for the tensor product as pairs of basis vectors from the two components. And you see immediately from this in finite dimensions that uh, if the dimension of H is M and the dimension of K is N, then the dimension of H tensor K is going to be M times N. And also then it becomes very plausible that this looks like a matrix. Uh, of entries from the two, uh, the two Hilbert spaces. And so you can almost see from this, the, this kind of the fact that you can view elements of the tensor product as actually being linear maps from one factor to the other. And a lot of the ideas about information flow in, in quantum protocols can be articulated um, from that point of view. Um, if we represent qubit space with a standard basis, so this is the Dirac Ket notation, but it's just uh, uh, two basic, uh, well, this is two dimensional complex Hilbert space. Here are the two basis vectors. Uh, and the idea is a general state can be some linear combination of these things, as it were, some superposition, superposition between being in the state zero and being in the state one, uh, as is often said. Then just by Iterating this, you see that the, um, the basis for an n qubit state will be indexed by all the binary strings of length n. And this is the exponential growth of the um, uh, space as we, um, um, if we go to n, as, as the n grows in the, in, in the uh, qubit registers. Okay, so. Um, so that by way of background, so um, we want to talk about how the, 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 the sort of situations we've been describing, where we have these empirical models, things that describe data that we could observe, uh, wh which of those could arise from quantum mechanics? That's the, that, yes. You were comparing before with vector spaces, but here you have a topology, you have a completeness. Where, where does it come in? Well, as I was saying, mostly we're, going, we're not going to need to talk about that because we're mostly just going to be in finite dimensions. Uh, but of course, it, it is a serious question when, when you go to uh, the infinite yeah, dimensional the case. Has to be complete somehow. Yes, this was the, uh, this was the, the point here. Um, but just in your comparison with linear algebra. Then. Yes, sure. Um, arbitrary yeah, but what I'm saying, yeah, but what I'm saying is that uh, in, in quantum information, we're mostly just looking at finite dimensions. Um, and you might think then that all the interesting stuff in quantum mechanics came from the infinite dimensional aspects and the analytical aspects that arise from solving the, the Schrodinger equation and so on. But actually, quantum information is here to tell us that there's a wealth of subtlety even in these finite dimensional situations. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that in uh, Simona's talk uh, this afternoon. And part of the reason for that is this multilinear aspect that we just briefly mentioned here with the tensor product. OK, so the, um, it's actually a rather wonderful thing that uh, quantum mechanics, although in some ways it's very puzzling, is one of the physical theories that has been axiomatized with a high degree of mathematical precision. In some ways, it's much, um, it's much harder to axiomatize some of the theories of classical physics to a comparable level. And this was achieved by, by von Neumann around 1930. I mean, there's another very influential presentation by Dirac, which was uh, less rigorous um, and involved those Dirac delta functions that uh, Prakash mentioned in his uh, lectures. But uh, the, the standard thing that people use is uh, for ordinary quantum mechanics and, and use on a day-to-day -day basis in, uh, in, in, in the work in quantum information is this uh, axiomatic presentation. 
I should mention, by way of contrast, that, that the situation is very different when you go to quantum field theory, which is the setting for current day particle physics. So it's, it's a much richer uh, subject, but also the issue of mathematically rigorizing it, even though quantum field theory more or less started in the 1930s and uh, was sort of fully formed in, in some sense, by the, I guess, by the late 40s. Uh, but the issue of, rig of making it rigorous and at the same time adequate to the, uh, the sort of phenomena that um, standard model and so on that people are working with in, in current day experiments uh, uh, remains quite a, well, it, well, it remains uh, um, uh, quite, a, quite a, a challenging question, although not necessarily one that's interesting to physicists um, who are quite happy with uh, their, uh, their way of doing quantum field theory. But at any rate, we don't have to worry about that because we're, um, um, uh, we're just dealing with standard, uh, with basic, uh, ordinary, as it were, ordinary quantum mechanics, which is used as a working tool not only in quantum information but in vast swathes of uh, condensed matter physics and lots of other uh, stuff that's uh, going on. So, what are the ingredients of this uh, axiomatization? Uh, states of the system are given by unit vectors in complex Hilbert space. Um, um, as Andreas was mentioning in his talk the other day, there's some redundancy in this because it's uh, up, to, um, uh, up to a global phase, a, a, a complex scalar factor of, um, um, of unit modulus um, that, um, that, that doesn't give significant uh, information to the state. So a better way of saying what the state is, is, is to identify it with the corresponding one-dimensional subspace, the ray, which is generated by the vector. But in practice, for calculational purposes, people usually use vectors. Uh, dynamics are given by the Schrodinger equation, whose solutions are given by unitary maps on the Hilbert space. In, um, um, whereas in, in modeling physical systems, this, this has paramount importance, and it's all about finding the right Hamiltonian to describe the, the physical system in question. Um, in quantum information, uh, this kind of dwindles, um, and, and you actually you very rarely see the Schrodinger equation. You never see that h-bar constant, uh, and actually what one works with are the unitary maps. And if you think of a circuit, a gate, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quantum computation, it just is a unitary map. And those are the building blocks for describing larger uh, uh, quantum processes. So as one takes a different point of view and asks different kinds of questions, different aspects of the formalism become more important and come to the fore, and others somewhat less so. Observables, um, the, the kind of measurements we can perform, are given by self-adjoint operators on the, on the Hilbert space. So self-adjoint, well, we have, um, so we have a, um, um, the adjoint of a matrix, of a complex matrix, is just the conjugate transpose of the matrix. So take the transpose and uh, conjugate all the entries. Take the complex conjugates of all the entries. Um, now, here's a beautiful thing, that when we come to giving this an operational interpretation, so self-adjoint operators, the spectral theorem of linear algebra tells us that a self-adjoint operator can be written in a, in a diagonal basis, so we get an orthonormal basis, and we can write it uh, in this form. And these are the um, uh, eigenvectors of the basis, and these are the eigenvalues. Uh, the point is, operationally, then, that you think of the, the I mean, how does a self-adjoint operator represent a measurement? Well, you think of these different um, uh, elements of the, of the spectral resolution as giving you the different possible outcomes. So the eigenvalues would, be, would label the, 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 the kind of values you observe for the different outcomes. Um, and um, this is... Uh, yes, yes, yes. That, that's a bit sloppy writing it like that. I'm, I, I'm, the thing is, I'm using the well. Yes, so we could have the projection, the projectors. Uh, uh, yeah, um, you're right. Um, but I am going to use vectors to represent the projection operators when I do the calculations, which is why I wrote it in this slightly sloppy fashion. And in particular, I'm going to use this as my formulation of the Born rule. 
Um, so, uh, because otherwise we get into trace and so on. So, so, sorry? <laughs> there we are, yes. I'm really getting into, into it. Uh, so, uh, it's quite addictive when you start <laughs> taking all these shortcuts. So, so this, is, this is a really important point, because this all looks like some maths and so on. And, I mean, uh, but but we, in the end, we want to get a, a number which should be a probability, which we can relate to what we see in the lab when we actually set up an experiment and perform measurements. So this is the thing we call the Born Rule, which gives us that basic uh, predictive information. So, the, so if we're in a state given by some vector psi, um, then the probability of getting the outcome labeled by this lambda i is going to be uh, given by the square modulus of this inner product. So this is what the Born rule says. And that will be a, a, a non-negative real number. And actually, uh, these, these will even normalize nicely and um, we'll get a probability distribution on outcomes. So, some, uh, so this is a sort of very sh brief uh, take on um, this uh, axiomatization. So one should make some caveats. Uh, of course, it's important in, a, in any kind of realistic setting, if we're considering information, to consider the fact that we, that we have noisy environments, unsharp measurements, unsharp preparations. So there's an, uh, there's an, um, and therefore, um, one studies mixed rather than pure states, so density operators rather than vectors, unsharp measurements represented by so-called POVMs, positive operator valued measurements, rather than the, uh, the, the projective measurements, often called von Neumann measurements, in fact, of the kind we were describing here, um, and so on, so forth. Um, and this is all true, um, but uh, in some sense, it doesn't matter. And um, because one can always resort to a larger dimensional Hilbert space and recover mixed from pure states and unsharp from sharp measurements. So you think of the representing the activity of the environment by adding extra stuff, usually called the ancilla, um, which represents the extra degrees of freedom you can't directly observe, and then sort of tracing out, as it were, marginalizing from that. And this mixes in all the noise you're getting from the environment uh, from what would have otherwise been a sharp description. And formally, this is underwritten by results such as the Steinspring dilation theorem. Uh, and there's a nice phrase uh, due, I think, to John Smolin, um, where one appeals to the church of the larger Hilbert space. Um, so uh, therefore, um, one isn't really at a fundamental level, or at least in theory. And you know, as they say, um, the difference between theory and practice is not very great in theory, but not in practice. Um, <laughs> So, um, so, in, so, so in principle, this is a perfectly good description of what's going on. And even if we, for many purposes, would, use, would, would sort of use these more general representations, we could reduce them to the case of pure states and sharp measurements in this fashion. And this will, um, anyway, we'll take this as our justification for sticking to the uh, simplest level of uh, presentation. Okay, so the, the important thing is, we've already hinted with mention of the, the Born rule, that these mathematical structures can be associated with operational procedures which can be performed in the lab or observed in nature or nowadays um, can be built into the devices that people are trying to build to turn uh, these ideas into uh, quantum technology. Um, uh, devices for doing quantum cryptography, uh, quantum computation, and so forth. So there are preparation procedures to produce quantum states. I mean, uh, they're, they're actually well-established um, optical procedures for, uh, for producing entangled pairs of, uh, of states. There are measurement devices with things like uh, photon detectors now achieving uh, very impressive levels of, of efficiency, which um, is one of the reasons why some of those experiments that I mentioned in the opening lecture have been uh, uh, so impressively successful uh, recently, interferometers and various other things. And there are, um, and, and of course, then we get these empirical probabilities of getting outcomes when measuring a state produced by some preparation process P with measurement device D. 
And then you can do exactly the kind of abstraction we have been doing, where you're saying rather than, um, you know, rather than presupposing a, a, a particular elaborate uh, physical theory with its own mathematical structure, such as quantum mechanics, let's just look at the general setting where you have some preparation procedures, some class of preparation procedures, some class of measurements, and rules that tell you what probabilities you have of getting um, outcomes from preparations with measurements. Uh, in a given setting. So this leads to what are called generalized probabilistic theories as a means of studying the space of possible physical theories via their operational content. And this has been quite a fruitful perspective on um, studying quantum information in this, in this broader setting. And I would say all of this has been directly inspired by Bell's theorem and the whole, uh, the whole nature of it is really leading one in this direction. That one, rather than presupposing a particular theory, one is really looking at the space of possible theories and what is possible within that. And that is, of course, a point of view that should be very congenial to um, a, logician, for, uh, a logician's point of view, for example. Uh, so this, um, and this has led actually also to interesting uh, things in applications such as so-called device independent quantum key distribution where you're relying only on observation of violation of Bell inequalities without presupposing that the, the box you've got is operating according to the rules of quantum mechanics uh, in order to give the uh, cryptographic um, guarantees. And the device independent perspective is, is, is also now going into studies of uh, quantum complexity, for example. A sort of generalized quantum complexity. Okay, so, uh, but now let's come back to the quantum representation. So this, here we're, we're emphasizing this operational point of view, but now we, when we look at the quantum representation, um, we have these complex numbers, we have these Hilbert spaces, and somehow from them we get um, uh, uh, things that we can relate to um, uh, these, these operational uh, considerations. So in particular, we have the basic model of the qubit. So a qubit is, 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 is living where you just have two degrees of freedom, so it's the basic unit for information processing, just as in the classical case the bit is. Um, so it's two-dimensional complex vector space, so we would represent it by four real numbers, but we're looking at unit vectors, so we get an, a constraint, a, nor, um, a normalization constraint, so we can represent things with three real numbers. And again, as Andreas was uh, um, describing in, in his talk uh, last week, um, there's this uh, uh, representation in terms of... Um, I mean, this is linked to this representation by the group of, uh, real, of real rotations, SO3. At any rate, we get this representation on the sphere where a, a state, a pure state, uh, corresponds to a point on the surface of the sphere. A nice point is that uh, with the, the convex closure of this gives us all the, um, uh, fills in the whole solid um, sphere and gives us the mixed states as well. But anyway, the pure states live on the surface. Um, and, um, the, sorry, the, the, the ball, I should say. Um, but the pure states live on the surface. So this is the one qubit case, and um, we can visualize it like this. And then if we're going to think of measurement, we, we choose a direction, to, uh, say, of spin, or uh, we're, we're detecting a photon polarization, whatever. So we choose, we choose a direction in space, uh, and that determines a pair of antipodal points on the sphere which give us the direction, say, spin up and spin down. And uh, we have the state, and when we measure, we're projecting the state down onto this uh, axis chosen for the, for, the, for the measurement. And the angles actually determine the probabilities with which we get the, uh, one of the two possible answers, spin up or spin down, for the measurement given on that state. So, um, so the, the salient properties of the qubit from our point of view, so states of the qubit, as we're saying, are represented as points on the surface of the sphere. So there's a continuum of such things. Obviously, we're in a, a complex vector space. Each pair um, of antipodal points define a possible measurement. Uh, when we subject a qubit to uh, a measurement given by this pair of antipodal points, 
The state of a qubit determines a probability distribution on the two possible outcomes. And these probabilities are determined by the angles between the state and the, and, and the points which specify the measurement. Um, now, of course, you could take the points, turn them into projectors, and have this kind of op more, maybe more uh, uh, mathematically nicer um, uh, operator formulation of the measurement, but I'm, I'm just doing things in this very concrete fashion. So in algebraic terms, these are all unit vectors in this complex vector space, and the probability of observing, say, spin up one of the two possible outcomes in state psi is just given, as we were saying, by this Born rule, which is just the square modulus of the inner product of the two vectors. And this gives the basic predictive content of quantum mechanics when it, when it comes right down to it. So um, qubits do generalize bits in that for each question we can ask, uh, there are just two possible answers. And we can view the states of the qubit as superpositions of the classical state 0 and 1, so that rather than having a single determinate answer, you get probabilities for each of the two possible answers. But there are also a lot of different questions that we can ask, and this is a disanalogy with a classical bit. Uh, as it were, with a classical bit, there's only one basis, um, and uh, we're going to get the answer 0 and 1, but we have this uh, many different um, directions for um, uh, many different questions that we can ask in the case of the qubit. And we get this issue of compatibility. We cannot simultaneously observe up or down in two different directions. Um, and the other point is that a measurement has an effect on the state, which will no longer be the original state, but actually will be collapsed into um, the um, state one um, up or down that we were measuring in. So this is what's indicated here. As a result of doing the measurement, this state uh, is going to end up either pointing there or pointing or being there or being there. So, so it's, this is often put by saying that quantum measurement has a kind of retrodictive uh, effect. It doesn't actually tell you where the state was before, but you know um, after, immediately afterwards where it is. Um, by the answer that you get from the measurement. So this also means that if you, um, you know, in, in, with appropriate, um, it also means that if you do the same measurement twice in succession, you'll get the same answer the second time as you got the first time. Uh, it also means that we can use measurement also to do preparation um, because um, if we want to put uh, a state to be, for example, here, if you measure it, uh, and uh, let's say you wanted it to be here, if you measure it, and if you got, if you well, if you get the answer down, you've got it where you want it to be. If you get the answer up, you just do the measurement again until eventually you get this uh, this answer, and then you know where it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, things get really interesting when we have more than one qubit because then the phenomenon of entanglement arises. We already discussed this a bit, and, and this is where things live in the tensor product, and where because of uh, the fact that we get these linear combinations, um, that we can uh, get correlations between the components. So if some of these coefficients go to zero, we can get um, things that look like this. Uh, and this, this austere looking mathematical formulation is exactly what underlies these ideas about spooky action at a distance and, and non-locality, which in some sense Bell's theorem is showing is an unavoidable aspect of the, um, what quantum mechanics is telling us because it can't be accounted for by any local uh, hidden variable theory. Okay, so here's that table again. And the important point is that this table is physically realizable. Uh, it's generated by this Bell state. And exactly this state, by the way, is the kind of thing that is typically generated as an entangled pair with, with current um, quite reliable optics uh, technology. And we can then, so that's one ingredient. We have this state, and then we can get these actual probabilities by having suitable measurements in the xy plane at a suitable angle to each other. Um, so um, what we want to do 
is actually, so I want to actually just go through the, um, uh, just to be completely concrete and specific, to go through an example of computing uh, an entry in the table, uh, just, to, just to see how it comes out from this, uh, this representation. So we're going to, so here's the state sitting, uh, obviously this is not, not, I mean this is the state sitting somewhere on the surface of the block sphere. We're going to be interested in choosing for the settings that Alice and Bob can take um, vectors lying in the equatorial plane of the sphere. Um, so um, if I have, uh, so I can take the x for example as, um, uh, so the spin up is going in this direction and the, the point antipodally opposite on the equatorial plane will be spin down. Um, so a general description of a vector lying on the equatorial plane is given like this where we have a, a, a phase factor giving us the, um, so it's a mixture of uh, the, so if, if the spin up is, is in the z direction, it's going to be a mixture of um, uh, the, the point up at the North Pole and the point up at the, uh, the point down at the South Pole with a suitable phase factor to give us an angle. Uh, and these will be expressions, so the, and there'll be a pair of uh, antipodal points. So if one of them, a spin up, has its angle given here, then uh, we need to add uh, pi to the angle to get the antipodal point. So very concretely, these are the two vectors that specify a measurement in the equatorial plane of the Bloch sphere. Um, so if, if it's x itself, then, um, then we just take the angle to be zero, and this is the standard x vector. So a sort of basis here is given by these um, coordinate uh, vectors which relate to the Pauli operators, the Pauli spin operators. Um, Okay, um, and then we just get uh, uh, these two vectors. Is everyone reasonably happy with this? Any questions? Uh, okay. So they're, they're just vectors anyway, and we can. Uh, uh, so let's say we, we, we want, I want to justify this entry in the table. Uh, how do I do it? Well, um, what we're doing here is taking our, we're taking one of our measurement settings to be the vector x itself and the other to be the vector still on the equatorial plane, but at an angle pi over 3 to x. So just in this format that we showed here. Um, and Alice and Bob are going to use each the same measurement on their own qubit. So they have, we have a two qubit system. Uh, on, on Alice's qubit, she measures either in direction x or in the direction at angle pi over 3 to x. Bob does the same measurements, but on his qubit. Um, so, what does an event like this correspond to? Alice chooses measurement A, which is just uh, uh, measuring in the direction x. Bob chooses measurement B prime, which is measuring in the angle pi over 3 to x. So those are the vectors that represent, and, and then we're interested in the outcome 0, 1. So that's spin up for Alice and spin down for Bob. And therefore, um, these are the vectors that correspond to those outcomes. So that's Alice on her qubit, Bob on his qubit, and we need to take the tensor product in order to get the joint outcome. Um, of these things, okay? And then um, what you do with the, to combine vectors with the tensor product is just multiply out, bearing in mind that the tensor product is a, is a, is a bilinear thing, so it should distribute over all the, all the sums on all, all the linear, uh, over linear structure on both sides. So we multiply out, cross multiply out, we get four terms over here that look like this. Okay, it's just, uh, so this is the vector in, four, in um, four dimensions, which is the joint measurement by Alice and Bob. And it's this measurement which we're going to perform on the entangled state which we have here, this Bell state. And according to the Born rule, we're just going to take the square modulus of this inner product. Okay. 
so now we're just down to um, just doing some um, uh, ordinary algebra on, on, on complex vectors. So we can do that. Now the point is that all these vectors are pairwise orthogonal. That's the point about having orthonormal basis. So when each, multi when each is brought against a different vector, it goes to zero. So actually um, the two vectors here will just select out the two corresponding components here and everything else will go to zero. And what we're left with is this expression here. Just, we end up just with the, co the corresponding coefficients. We're doing nothing more than doing inner products of vectors. Um, and well, we go through and uh, remember a little complex algebra and we end up with, uh, lo and behold, the probability 1, 8, 1 over 8. Um, there's something amazing about, I, I, I find out about this in the sense that we go through this detour in all this um, geometry, complex numbers and so on, and we end up with uh, something very operational, a probability, which we can relate to these operational procedures. That is, in some sense, the, one of the mysteries of uh, quantum mechanics. And, and really, all the other entries can be computed similarly. This is the whole story of how we get these tables. So, uh, as I say, mysteries of the quantum representation. Operationally, we see readings on measurement instruments and observe probabilities of outcomes. Uh, we never see a complex number, uh, but uh, quantum mechanics essentially uses this representation to compute the positive real numbers corresponding to what we actually observe. I mean, in terms of the numbers we see on readings, I mean, obviously we choose units anyway, and they're going to be, you know, just kind of readings on dials. Uh, so we never see a complex number. We just see labels for the different outcomes, and we see probabilities, we get frequencies. And yet we have to go through this highly non-obvious representation in, in, in complex Hilbert space to compute this, and, the, and then it corresponds uh, remarkably well to um, empirical observation. So of course there's a, a kind of a question, what, what, what explanation can we give for this? And indeed over the last, um, well, a, a really a long time, but, but with perhaps with renewed energy over the last 15 years or so, there have been many attempts to find compelling axioms for, from which the, quant I mean, well, what's particularly been true over the last 15 years or so is emphasizing this operational point of view and attempts to find compelling axioms from which starting, as it were, from this operational reality that we have, uh, to, 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 um, to get axioms from which the representation in complex Hilbert space can be derived, to answer the question why, why a Hilbert space is the right thing. And one of the uh, particularly influential papers that started this whole direction off was one by Lucian Hardy, Quantum Mechanics from Five Reasonable Axioms from around 2001. Um, the same Hardy as of uh, Hardy's Paradox, incidentally. Uh, and then there have been uh, attempts by quite a lot of other people in a similar vein, uh, perhaps most notably by the Pavia group, um, who've uh, got a very nice presentation um, which has uh, been uh, quite, uh, quite influential. Uh, Mauro D'Ariano, Giulio, Giulio Kirabella and Paolo Perinotti. But I think it's fair to say that um, none of these there's always some axiom of a more mathematical nature or, you know, that, that. So, so I don't think the question has fully, fully been answered. It remains uh, something, of a, something of a mystery. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts. Okay, so, um, so that's where we are. So hopefully now it's clear how, um, in an unambiguous and precise way, quantum mechanics can generate tables of the kind we've been considering. Um, and the particular table here, as we say, is completely generated in the way we've described. It's possible to, by adjusting the angles a bit, to get uh, a similar but slightly different table, which gives a higher winning uh, probability of success for that XOR game we were describing uh, in, the, in the first lecture. Actually, there's, there's a provable uh, Mac, um, optimal uh, winning pro probability that can be achieved by quantum mechanics. Uh, actually, so the classical limit was 0.75. 
the quantum account, this is, as we remember, had a violation of a quarter uh, of, the, of the Bell inequality, so it has a success probability of 0.81. You can actually get up to 0.83, um, which is the, the provable optimum by quantum mechanics. And then on the other hand, you have the PR box, uh, which, which, has, which is a winning strategy, success probability one, and cannot be achieved in quantum mechanics. Again, another mystery is why does quantum mechanics take us so far but no further? Okay, so um, yeah, there's the PR box. Uh, and and it, it satisfies no signaling, as we've discussed, so it's consistent with relativity, but not quantum realizable. So uh, a, a good picture, which we'll return to in more, more detail in the next lecture. So did you tell us why the PR box is not quantum? Well, I just did, because, uh, there, well, okay, I haven't, I, haven't, I mean, you know, there is this bound on the, um, the, the maximum violation you can get of a Bell inequality by a quantum realizable model, which equivalently put is the maximum success probability we can get for the XOR game, which is 0.83, and here it's one. So uh, that's actually the, the uh, sort of uh, uh, direct proof. But the, whole, but the whole question of whether given a table, I mean, we can check whether it's no signaling quite easily. It's just a bunch of linear equations. But is it quantum realizable? That is a subtle question, and that's what we're now going to discuss more generally. So exceeding this, this bound tells yes. you you are not quantum realizable, yes. but you can be below it, be quantum or not be quantum realizable, right? Ah. Why um, is it difficult? Why is it not a necessary and sufficient condition for um, that's, I think that's, that's right, but it's also the question is also to do this in general for any empirical model. Yes, well, we're interested in doing this for any model, and that's what I'm going to discuss now. Yes. But it's also it's not an equivalence in, in, the, in, in, in even in the 222 case, which is this simple case with Alex and Bob, is not an equivalence. Thanks. Yeah. So here's a picture. Um, the Bell inequality is bound what can be achievable by non contextual models, models with a classical source, they form a polytope. And if we fix the, the, the measurement scenario, the, remember the number of measurements and outcomes and so forth, then we get a shape for this polytope. We get a well-defined set of models that live in the non-contextual zone. Um, so I've drawn it nice and, I mean, it's a polytope. There's a larger polytope which properly includes this non-contextual one of all the no-signaling models, which again, they're defined by some equations. Marginals have to coincide. And again, they obviously have to be probabilities. Uh, so it's another polytope which includes the non-contextual one. And sitting between these two polytopes is the quantum set, uh, which properly includes the non-contextual models and is properly included, as we've just said, in the, um, in the uh, no-signaling polytope. And this set is uh, convex and closed, but it's not a polytope. Um, there isn't a complete set of uh, inequalities that, that characterizes it, linear inequalities that characterizes it. And a key question is to find um, compelling reasons to explain why nature picks out the quantum set, somewhat allied to the, the question we were just uh, considering, um, uh, well, uh, here, I guess. <coughs> question of why, why the quantum specifically. So um, let me just uh, briefly put on a general footing this idea of realizing a, um, an empirical model in the way we've been describing it. It's essentially just a general formulation of what we've seen in, in particular cases. Um, actually, here I'm only doing it for the Bell kind of scenario, but one can do it more generally for any, uh, any empirical model over any um, measurement scenario of the kind that we, we discussed last time. So here we have n agents. Each ith agent can choose any of the measurements from the set mi, and the possible outcomes come from the set hi. So to represent this, we pick a Hilbert space for each of the agents. So they're going, then going to live in the tensor product, generali uh, generalizing the sort of Alice-Bob situation. And for each um, possible measurement and outcome for that measurement, we have a, um, a unit vector in our simple representation of um, 
measurements in such a way that the, these vectors form an orthonormal basis. Actually, this is um, not as general as it, as it could be, but it, it'll do for our purposes. Um, uh, so we're basically, we're assigning quantum measurements as represented by um, the sort of orthonormal basis we get out of the spectral resolution for, for, a, for a measurement operator. Um, and, and then, so there's a vector associated with each outcome of the measurement. And the state is uh, some other vector, a unit vector sitting in the tensor product. And then for each choice of measurement um, of each agent choosing a measurement from their set and, uh, a, co and a corresponding outcome for each of those measurement, then what the Born rule is telling us is that the probability given that we're in this state and we're performing these quantum measurements, the probability of getting that joint outcome when those measurement settings are selected is given, as we've already seen now several times by the Born rule, which is the square modulus of an inner product. So this is just what we were concre computing concretely earlier, uh, um, writ large in a more general setting. And we take QM to be the class of empirical models which are realized by quantum systems in this fashion. So this is now a mathematically well-defined class. As I say here, I'm only looking at Bell scenarios. We could do it more generally for any empirical model over any measurement scenario, but we get into uh, slightly more, uh, 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 we'll just keep it simpler at this level. So we take, um, for a given Bell scenario like this, we can stratify this set by saying, taking QM of D to be the subclass of models realizable in a Hilbert space of finite dimension D. Notice that on the one hand, we have a fixed size of this Bell scenario, but we also have a choice of how big we take these uh, Hilbert spaces to be. And therefore, in the end, how big this tensor product Hilbert space is. Here is an example, another example. We had the Bell table before. This is a way of realizing the Hardy model. Remember, with the Hardy model, um, we, we could argue for contextuality at the, just at the possibilistic level. And here is a suitable choice of states and measurements that will do that for us. Again, we have a two qubit system. Uh, we, um, the the, the some, uh, measurement for Alice and for Bob will just be measurement in the computational basis um, uh, labeled by zero and one. And then um, the other measurements will, will be um, uh, these slightly ugly looking things here. And the state is taken to be this two qubit state. Um, this is just a choice, but um, the important point, since remember all we needed to make the Hardy the Hardy Sudoku argument go through was uh, was to have zeros in three places and a and a positive probability in the other place. These choices do give us the zeros in the appropriate entries of the table, and they give a positive probability uh, in the top left entry. These this is a joint outcome zero zero for these measurements, uh, of which is actually very near the maximum uh, attainable value. Um, as I'm, and therefore the possibilistic collapse of this model, if we, if we only remember what's po probability zero or greater than zero, is indeed a Hardy model, and we get that stronger form of contextuality. As I mentioned last time, there's a general result that says given any entangled state with just this exceptional class of maximally entangled bipartite states, but given any other entangled n qubit state, we can find some measurements from which we will get um, uh, local choices of measurements for, Alec, for the n parties, which will witness um, uh, a Hardy model, this form of non-locality. OK, so um, how bad is this class QMD? Well, it's, well, um, depending on what you think is bad, uh, I, I think um, Dexter Cozen has said you can't do anything in program verification in less than p-space. Um, Anyway, uh, this class is in p-space um, and uh, in, a, in a fairly simple way. Um, so we're fixing the dimension. And the condition for re quantum realization, after all we're saying there exists a state and there exists local observables such that if you compute out those inner products and so on, you end up with these entries. So you're fixing the table so you know what the entries are. And you can write all of that 
as in the end as a big existential formula. Uh, in, since you can represent complex numbers as pairs of real numbers, you can um, uh, represent it all as some uh, existential sentence in the uh, theory of uh, real closed fields. And as is uh, well known, this fragment has p-space complexity. So the membership of uh, this class is in, uh, in p-space. But that's for a fixed dimension of Hilbert space, because of course that allows you to write a formula of a, of a fixed size, because you know how big the, uh, how many entries the matrices are going to have. So uh, we now come to the, uh, well, the first version of the decision problem. Can we bound the dimension D effectively so that the class QM itself is de decidable? Um, so, because obviously what we can do is to keep bumping up the dimension and applying this p-space algorithm. Um, and um, so at least we would know that if you could ever realize it in finite dimensions, you would get there in the end. But can we bound how big you have to look at? And um, intuitively, uh, you'd think you could, because after all, this is a fixed finite table. I mean, how big does the, should the Hilbert space need to be? Um, but we don't know the answer. Uh, so uh, a beautiful piece of uh, work recently in, in, the, in the quantum information literature is uh, answering a complementary question. It's giving an algorithmic way of determining when um, a model is not quantum realizable. So directly answering in a general way um, Fokion's question. Uh, and this is due to uh, Miguel Navasquez um, uh, Stefano Peronio and um, uh, Antonio Asin, the NPA hierarchy. Uh, so what they give is a, con uh, a convergent hierarchy of semi-definite programs characterizing the set of quantum correlations. So it's an infinite hierarchy of conditions expressed as semi-definite programs. So as we said, the non-contextual set is, is, is a polytope defined by linear constraints. The no signaling set is a polytope defined by linear constraints. But when we start writing out the formulas for quantum realization, we're certainly getting, get, going to get into quadratic constraints. And we need uh, a richer class of, um, of uh, uh, programs, semi-definite programs. And we get this hierarchy, which is sort of a, could be seen as some kind of non-commutative version of uh, one of the hierarchies that have been studied a lot recently in recent work in algorithms. Um, relaxation hierarchies. Each successive semi-definite program runs in polynomial time in its given program size, but of course that grows very rapidly in fact. And essentially at level n, so why do we need to keep sort of iterating this hierarchy? Because at level n we're looking at conditions on n-fold products of the projectors which would witness the quantum realizability of the model. By the way, they do use projective uh, measurements appealing to the, the dilation theorem and so on, which we mentioned earlier. Um, and so you get, it's like a word problem where even though you start off from a finite amount of data, you keep getting sort of longer and longer conditions that you need to verify. And what they prove is that the sequence of tests is complete. So we get, a, we get a descending family of sets that are filtered out by means of this hierarchy of semi-definite programs. So in the limit, you, you know that if a model passes all the tests, it is in this set QM. And if it fails any of the tests, it is not in QM. Uh, this shows that, that QM is co-RE, the complement of an RE set. Um, but, so you might think, well, okay, I just showed you that, that if something was in QM, it, it's in, um, that, that's an RE set, and I, we just said that it's co-RE, so put them together, and we might get a very horrible, from a complexity point of view, but nevertheless a decision procedure for the set QM. But there's a snag, which is rather interesting. Uh, in order to have enough room uh, to put all these conditions without kind of uh, um, um, spoiling anything, what they actually can conclude is that if something is in QM, it sits not in any of these finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but in infinite dimensional Hilbert space. It sits in the sequence space, well, if you like, in the sequence space, the separable Hilbert space. Um, so, um, so that's what they're actually proving. Um, now, um, 
there's an obvious, so the question is, is there a difference between these finite tables that you can realize in some finite dimensional Hilbert space and those that you can realize in infinite dimensional Hilbert space? On first sight, it seems hard to believe that you would really need an infinite dimensional Hilbert space to realize a finite table. Um, they, they have as a kind of uh, um, uh, result uh, along the way in their development, they show that the model admits a finite dimensional realization if and only if a certain condition holds at some finite level of the hierarchy, but they can't show that that condition will always hold if, um, uh, if it's going to pass through all the tests. So, um, and this is, it seems to me, a rather fascinating point. This is a decision problem. Um, but on the other hand, saying that um, the, 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 the tables, the correlations that you can realize in a finite dimensional space is the same as what you can realize even in infinite dimensional space has a clear physical significance. It's saying that to realize finite tables of correlations um, I mean, if, to say that they're different is to say that something that seems pretty amazing, that to, that to realize a finite table of correlations, we need infinitely many degrees of freedom in the physical system. Um, so I, I think we have a purely mathematical decision problem, which I think is a really nice problem for logicians to, to look at. Um, uh, with, uh, sort of, uh, and I don't think it has been looked at um, from that point of view um, um, as yet. And on the other hand, a question with a clear physical and uh, operational content. Um, I should also mention that there are interesting connections, not exact uh, equivalences, but interesting connections with some actually quite renowned open questions in, um, in, uh, in the world of operator algebras, such as the con embedding problem. Essentially, the knowing whether these, whoops, whether these two things correspond can be expressed in terms of whether a certain, some C star algebras are residually finite, and this relates to these, uh, these uh, known to be or believed to be very hard uh, open problems, which have certainly been open for uh, quite some time. Uh, but it may be that, that logicians can um, uh, prove a result here, this, this, this decision problem, uh, which would shed light on these these uh, these open questions elsewhere in mathematics. So this is a little bit like a finite model property in some sense, because you are asking if it's realized. Yes. Yes. In yes. Space. yes. And we don't know. It's like when we have the cases of. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And and the thing is that, as I say, it's sort of. From a physical point of view, you know, it's sort of a, it would be extremely interesting to know the answer. I think. Um, it's it's again it's a, yet another mystery. I mean, you know, where does where does infinite dimensions really come in, and what do we need it for? But yes, it has exactly that uh, analogy, and um, um, I think it's it maybe a very good uh, thing where where people coming from a logic point of view can uh, have something to say. Okay, well, I guess I've uh, reached my end of my time. So I, I was going to say something very briefly about. Uh, constraint and satisfaction, but maybe you'll say something about it. Uh, not, not, uh, not no. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, so thanks. <laughs> but if there's any quick question, I'll... yeah. Uh, just a comment, because uh, I think your definition of uh, quantum realizability in the Bell scenario was, did you, were you asking for local measurements, right? Yes. Uh, whereas the NPR key actually converges to the set of things that are uh, quantum realizable, but not necessarily with local measurements, which in infinite dimensions is different, even though in finite dimensions it's the same. I don't ask for local measurements on uh, bipartite so systems. So, so you have three sets. So you have the things that are finite dimension, realized in finite dimensions, yep. which are contained in the things that are realized in infinite dimensions, um, but where you're, you have a projection in each of the space. And which are contained in things that are in infinite dimensions, but where you can have projectors uh, who sort of mix right. it. Right, yes. You just ask for, just ask for uh, commutativity instead of actually sure. being in Oh, commutativity, right, right. Yes, well, there, there's another, right, there's another issue there of the Tyrrellson well, the problem. The one is the one that the, NA, yeah. the, the NPA hierarchy converges to. Yeah. 
Yes, so there, well, uh, right. So there's another very interesting open question, the so-called Cyrilson problem, which is uh, which relates to whether um, uh, if you have commuting families of operators, which would be like compatible measurements, if you can always represent them on a tensor product. And um, we know in finite dimensions this is true, and in infinite dimensions the question is open, and that is strongly related to this uh, Kirchberg uh, conjecture, in fact. And that, yes, as Rui says, we're kind of, it would assume a uh, positive answer to the Cyrilson question to say that exactly that notion of quantum realizability would, um, uh, with local measurements would be uh, tested. Of course, it does make a difference if Alice and Bob have more limited possibilities of each measuring their part of the system separately than if we're, um, well, we, well, the question, is, yeah. So it still would have to be commuting uh, operators, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, okay, so that's the point. Yes, so there's a number of delicate uh, questions in this so area. between asking for them to be commuting and asking for them to be in yeah. two yeah. separate. Okay, any other questions? Oh, we can. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Can you yes, say sorry. the thing about constraint satisfaction? About? Can you say about constraint oh well, uh, <laughs> I don't want to keep people, um, but um, uh, I can say that that uh, Fokion and Gay have done some really nice stuff on uh, constraint satisfaction, somewhat inspired <laughs> by some of these uh, questions. Uh, it's led to some work on so-called robust constraint satisfaction. Uh, so there was some initial results from a couple of years ago, and, and they have, I think, a lot more results now. And the, just to say very briefly, the idea of robustness is that you're fixing the values of some of the variables. Can you extend it to a solution? And if you remember our discussion of the Hardy paradox, we were in a situation like that. You fixed this local section, and the question was, can you extend it to a, a global one that would be a sort of a solution for the whole uh, constraint satisfaction problem. And it turns out that this variant really leads to some quite interesting um, sort of developments that don't fall in the standard pattern. You get a, some very nice results um, uh, about the tractability boundary of this version of uh, CSP. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, right.